I think that the Negro people, uh, you know, accommodate those stores downtown, and I think it would be fair for us to sit and eat just like the white do. We walk and shop and get tired, and we have no place to eat, and we have to come to the east side and eat. A lot of people go to Browns and Cats and those other stores down there. And yes, I'm in favor of it. When I was growing up in Oklahoma City, there was, Oklahoma was one of the most segregated states in the Union. We had more segregated laws in Mississippi. We could not live across 7th Street. We could not go to any school that we wanted to. We could not ride the bus any place. When we go downtown to shop, we could go down there and spend all our money, but we could not go to a bathroom except if it said colored. We could not eat in any restaurant in Oklahoma City. It's so many things as a black person that we could not do, that I did not understand. It was full of bigotry and a lot of times hatred. And as a kid, you never, I, my problem was I could never understand how you could hate me and not know me. And being a part of the NAACP Youth Council at least gave me the opportunity to help change some things. And not knowing what impact that was going to have, but it doesn't take a rocket scientist for you to know what you can't do because of one reason and one reason only, and that was because of the color of my skin. And I think anybody would say something is wrong with that picture. It was during my, uh, that, that period between 1954 and 19, I guess maybe 1958, 59, 60. Uh, I think it was around 1958 when Clara Looper became involved and, and uh, became a, the many of her sit-ins during that period. And it was through the NAACP that I became involved in the civil rights movement. Be mindful, I was just a 12 or 13-year-old student. Uh, but the leaders, and uh, they were ministers, uh, uh, his history, uh, will record that many of those who led the civil rights movements were uh, uh, of ministerial background. And it, there was a belief that it was through the churches that we could engage more people in correcting a wrong. Um, and I was uh, directed by my aunt uh, and uh, allowed by my parents to sit, do the city in our first city in in Altus, Oklahoma, and it was at the bus station. Prior to our city-ins, we were allowed, we as African-American black people, uh, we were allowed to go into the, the bus station, but we could not sit where others could sit. There was a draped area. Uh, where we would have to sit in the very back in a draped area. Uh, as a child, I didn't necessarily understand that. Uh, but I also was being, be, being made aware of some of the injustices that had occurred uh, throughout the years and that uh, there was a time that we needed to stop it in Altus, Oklahoma. Uh, we did the, the bus the, the bus city in and as I recall we did it two or three different times. Uh, I remember sitting on the stool. Uh, and eventually, don't know what you know what the powers that be, the, the negotiation that took place, we were allowed to sit elsewhere in you know, anywhere in the bus station. The curtain fell down, I should say. I was kind of raised out here. <clears throat> But because of segregation, uh, couldn't go to school out here. Uh, so I had, that's why one of the reasons Dad stayed 
in Oklahoma City so I, I could go to school. Otherwise, if you was black living out here, you had to go to Shawnee to go to school. Norman was a, a, a red line district that, uh, you know, it's a sundown town. So uh, you had to be out of town by sundown. So uh, there was no school or anything then uh, until 1958, I think. Uh, and some of my cousins were the first ones to go to Norman High. Uh, because they had to open it up for integration. And so uh, my cousins had to go through that. And they, I'll never forget, the, uh, they were on the, on the news with the people throwing stuff, eggs and stuff at them as they was going, just like it happened in the South, you know, it happened in Norman High. We thought, I thought, that every place was like Oklahoma, segregated. full of bigotry and hatred because of the fact that I was black. As a matter of fact, my mother was a school teacher and she used to tutor all types of students. And I remember as a child, uh, one of her white students came over to the house and she looked at me and asked me, why does your mother hate you so much? I said, why does my mother hate me? She said, yes, why does your mother hate you so much? So my mother doesn't hate me. Yes, she does. She, if she didn't hate you, she never would have left you in the oven that long. <laughs> so that's, that's the type of society that people, <laughs> that people believed and were taught. I started participating in the city in, in junior high school and, of course, in high school. You learned a lot of things about what was going on that you could consider wrong. And I'm just going to use the word wrong, not because of my character, but because of the color of my skin. So when you learn these things and you were able to participate in an organization like the NAACP Youth Council to protest. And people would say, ask you whether that was illegal. And I'd like to show them the Constitution to show that the First Amendment gives you the right to protest in a peaceful manner, but if you are a citizen of the United States, you had a right to protest. So to participate in the sit-in under the leadership of Clara Lupa, I wasn't thinking about history. I was just thinking about, we need to change laws that segregated you, that excluded you. And when they exclude you and you're segregated because of the color of your skin, you didn't have a problem with being a part of changing that. So being a part of that gave me pride, but I never thought about it in terms of I was making history. Uh, as we, we were kids, we were students, we were obedient, and we knew that we had other problems, not just where to go eat, but like you say in education, you couldn't go to the schools that you wanted to attend. You couldn't go to any church because of segregation. You had so many segregated laws, uh, water fountains, restrooms, everything determined because of the color of your skin. Oklahoma City was the first, we were the first ones to, to use the city in, as they call it a city in now anyway. So they say, uh, South Carolina, I think, had the first one on record but I was went a year before theirs. Fight on until Oklahoma will truly become the land of the free and the home of the brave. For truly, integration is democracy. I look back now and I think that my mother was a genius because what she did was she plotted and planned a trip 
to New York where we would go the northern route and come back to the south. So we left Oklahoma City. And for the first time in our lives, uh, in my life, and I'll speak for the other kids that were on the trip because a lot of them had never left Oklahoma. We had an opportunity to go into a restaurant and sit down and drink a Coke and he'd eat a hamburger. You said, what? We could sit down like everybody else. This was one of the highlights of my life. So we went the northern route and, and those signs that said colored water fountain and colored bathroom and we didn't run into that. Harriet Tubman once said that a little bit of freedom is a dangerous thing. Oh, and we were happy. We were happy to be able to go just like anybody else and sit down and drink a Coke in a restaurant. The sit-in movement began here in August of 1958. That was a year and a half before the sit-ins that happened in Greensboro, North Carolina with SNCC. Um, the fact that the sit-ins here happened with Claire Looper was a school teacher working with students as young as seven years old. SNCC was primarily college students. Um, there's so much for us to be proud of as well as to share with the rest of the country. Um, and it really is an opportunity for everyone to learn more about what happened here. But everything back then was dictated because of segregation. So to be a part of the city and movement and to see that I had a little bit to do with that change gives me so much pride. And of course, I am thankful that we had leaders who allowed us and that I had parents who gave me permission because if it hadn't been for that and for them, I don't know where I would be. One of the experiences I had was the opportunity to go hear Dr. Martin Luther King deliver his I Have a Dream speech. It's not that I can tell you I heard him on television, I heard it on radio, but the fact that I had the opportunity to actually be there gave me so much sense of pride to see how many in the United States believed in what we were doing here in Oklahoma City at that march. And what is what was so uplifting for me, it wasn't just with blacks. All races of people believed in integration. All races of people believed in equality. And so that was an eye opener for me. We started the sit-ins and then so Clara the city ends was what, 1963? I think that's when March of Washington was. And, and so uh, Clara took two buses. Uh, it was, I think it was the first time I'd been out of town. Uh, and a whole bunch of us had never left the state, uh, the city, let alone the state. And so for, the, for us to make that trip, it was monumental. And talking about millions of people, it was, it was so many people you couldn't, you couldn't move. Good thing they had speakers where you could hear the speeches. And we were in a spot where you know, it was just millions. We couldn't even see the pool. And that was a significant thing in terms of my becoming involved and becoming aware that we can't, we must become engaged in our communities to make a difference. One, two, three. 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 This day 
and all of the events, in particular this event when we have the bell ringing and the remembrance of what the bell ringing really means is significant and important to me. I like to tell folks, I'll be 69 in a couple of months. I was born and raised in Memphis, Tennessee. I was there 13 years old when Dr. King was assassinated, when my mother came out the back door with tears running down her face and reported to me that Dr. King had been assassinated not too far from where we had lived. I knew enough then that that was something significant and he was someone special, not only to us, but to the world. And so to have that remembrance, to have this, this, this annual event is something I think we ought to do daily if you don't do anything but remember it because it is the most significant thing to impact this nation. For me, it means the fact that I can be here. It also means the fact that I have the freedom to wear my hair in a certain way with a crown this is my crown. So for me, just being here alone in this atmosphere is just rewarding. Um, black women of color weren't able to participate in pageantry in Oklahoma in the past, which is where Miss Clara Loper came in. Um, in fact, I was the first recipient of the Clara Loper Scholarship at Langston University when I was crowned Miss Black Langston University in 2008. And so this is very important for me. It has lots of history and it's rich in history for Oklahoma. Standing on the shoulders, um, of great people before me that, that opened that door for me to be able to walk through, the path for me to walk down, um, to be able to make a change within the communities where I live, within the community out anywhere, you know. I'm humbled and very grateful that I'm awarded that award and I, I'm gonna continue to stand up for that award and continue my work. That's what it means to me. August 19th. It was 1958, Oklahoma City was slow to integrate. Black and white restrooms could easily be found. And the smell of segregation was all over my town. Because had it not been for the John Reeves, had it not been for the Kevin Coxes and, you know, the Russell Perrys and and uh, the W.K. Jacksons and the Wade Wattses and the Clara Loopers and the Martin Luther Kings. I never could have played quarterback at the University of Oklahoma. I was the second black quarterback. Uh, 20 years prior to me walking on campus at the University of Oklahoma, they had the first black football player. 20 years is not a long time. 1956, 1976. Uh, I served in Congress for eight years because of the sacrifices that, that the Reverend Reeds and the Wade Watches and the Reverend Kings and the W.K. Jacksons, that my parents and grandparents, uh, they sacrificed so that I could stand on their shoulders and see just a little bit further than, than they did. So the eight-year-old can look at a J.C. Watts and look at a Reverend Reed and say, because of what you did and what Reverend King did and Clara Looper, what they did, he can look at me and say, I can benefit from their sacrifices just like J.C. Watts did. Well, Eastside Pizza House is really what I wanted to, what I want it to be is um, something that the people in this community felt like was theirs and they can take ownership of. Um, where they come in and they, and they see people that look like them, where they come in and they feel at home and they feel like they, um, you know, they, they were thought about when they, when they walk in. Um, also, with everything that's going on on the east side, there's no telling what this street will look like in um, five years, 10 years. So, you know, there are other places in the city and on the east side where, you know, where we're thriving black communities and thriving black businesses, and now you go there and there's no trace that we were, even, we were ever even there, you know. So regardless of what this street looks like in the future, you walk in Eastside Pizza House, you know this was ours, you know what I'm saying? You know we were here, and not only that, it tells the story, you know, um, the faces, you know. Um, that's a map of the East Side, you know. Um, uh, the words, and people might come in here and they might know the name Clara, Clara Looper, but not, might not ever seen her or know what she looks like. Uh, they might know the name Ralph Ellison, but never seen him, not know what he looks like. You know, uh, E. Melvin Porter, you know, people like that. Uh, people who 
whenever I was growing up, you know, I understood, you know, how important they were and understood that it was because of them that, you know, I was able to have the opportunities I had, you know, Roscoe Dungee, people like that, um, so many more. And so uh, I just want, you know, people to come in and also kind of be educated on that because it's important, um, you know, and it's important that we continue to tell those stories and not let anybody else tell them for us. Um, so as we look ahead, really the hope is that these, these historical investments in minority entrepreneurship across the country really transforms what uh, entrepreneurship looks like and really creates um, a community wealth. You know, we talk about wealth building quite a bit. We really think about it in the individual sense. But really what it is, is we're trying to make our efforts to create community wealth. If we want to go back to what we're looking at in Greenwood and Deep Deuce, that's what existed was community wealth. You know, because in the beginning, Whenever I got the space, um, I was thinking I would do something with music in here, like a record store, you know, have a place people can perform and, you know, things like that. And around that time, um, there was a grocery store on the corner of MLK that closed down. And, uh, you know, just listen to the people in the community and everybody was like, you know, they shouldn't have closed and they need to reopen and they don't care about us and they did this and them and they and I was just like man ain't no them and no they it's us you know um and I was like you know I need to do something that involves food you know and um opportunity for the community um something that people would be excited about and actually um you know could give a little bit more um and show people we don't have to we don't, we don't need to be waiting for somebody else to do it for us, you know, um, and depending on them and they, when we got us. When we were growing up in the civil rights movement, we were, it's, my mother would tell us that you need to develop some tough skin. And if you don't have tough skin, you need to go and buy you some at the hardware store. That's what I would tell the young people. Because in America, when you, if you're born black, you go live black and you're going to die black. And you're going to suffer the injustices of the system only because of the color of your skin. So get ready for it, but deal with it. And deal with it with pride and stamina. <laughs>